So hopefully you're in the right place. This is optimal territory planning with Tableau. Uh, I'm Hunter Barcelo. I'm a senior sales operations analyst with Tableau uh, based out of Seattle uh, in our Fremont office uh, specifically. Um, just a little bit about me. Uh, you know, I like basketball, skiing in the Northwest, uh, coffee also in the Northwest. I hit most of the Northwest stereotypes. Uh, this is Justin. Hi, I'm Justin Kruger. I'm a manager in sales operations. I've uh, been here for five years, just coming up on five years. Um, my, some of my mottos are work smarter, not harder. Um, and I also just like coffee and beer and skiing and, or snowboarding. And uh, you got your brewery hat on in our picture yeah, effort. Good luck. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I really hope that you guys get some stuff that you can take back to your organization today and apply, whether it's actually in Tableau or it's a methodology to your planning process to help you guys be a little more efficient um, and collaborative across the organization. So, yeah. yeah, so now, what about you all? We had a chance to go and talk to a few of you, but we're just going to do another kind of quick uh, show of hands exercise. Uh, so how many of you are in sales operations? All right. How many of you are in sales? Right. We're kind of both. We're in sales operations under under sales org, uh, but I'm not a I'm not a direct seller. Uh, so how many of you are analysts? Ooh, all right, a lot of analysts, my people. All right. uh, how many of you are managers? All right, another good portion. There you go. You're Justin's <laughs> people. Right there. Uh, so you know, one of the things that's really great about TC is we've got all these people who are kind of in a very specific use case in a very specific industry all together at the same time when it would be super hard to really meet each other in any other context. Uh, so maybe we just take one minute and kind of introduce yourselves to a couple people around you because uh, we're really just hoping to get a lot of good you know, knowledge exchange today mm -hmm. between everybody. So let's just take one minute and, and make a new friend in sales ops. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. I love, I love that you guys are all so outgoing. Uh, you can tell that you're supporting the sales organization. <laughs> all right. So I'll use the slide as a, wow, like you guys, are, you guys are like the super social group of the sales operations people. Like we, once we, do, once we, we, we gave you permission to chat, it was like the, the floodgates opened. So I'm just going to quickly go ahead and give you kind of an overview of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so first, why would you want to use Tableau for sales territory planning? You know, there's a lot of tools out there. Uh, you know, why would you choose Tableau? I'm uh, going to just go over some general kind of sales territory creation and planning process best practices, because even if you have really great tools at your disposal, if your, your underlying process and communication is really poor, you're going to have trouble no matter what. Right? No, no tool can solve these other problems all for you. Uh, we're going to talk about choosing your metrics and how you may want to, what type of data points you may want to look at as you're constructing your territories you might find useful. And then lastly, we're going to do a demo, so we're going to show you how we do it. Uh, at the end of our demo, you're going to end up with a little dashboard like this. Uh, going to show you some of your territory balances. We're going to show you some kind of detailed boundaries and some aggregate boundaries. All right. So why would you want to use Tableau for sales territory planning? So our experience has been that there's a lot of software out there that says it's great you know, for territory alignment. Our experience has also been that it's really expensive, and it's typically very hard to use, and hard to train people to use, and it's usually buggy and crashes a lot as well to boot. So the value proposition we found is pretty poor, especially given that you're maybe only utilizing it three or four months of the year. Right? So you're paying a lot of money for the software that you don't even use half the time. Uh, we found that actually once we ditched our commercial territory optimization software, uh, we are creating territories faster. We cut our territory creation time by about 60 to 70 percent. We also found that it go as we went through this process, we were getting better dialogue with our sales leadership. Uh, in the prior paradigm, we had just a couple of people that were licensed to use this software. 
you know, it, and it took a while to run. So it was going to be very hard to get a sales executive to come down to somebody's desk to sit next to them and watch the circle spin as we went through all these different territory scenarios, right? So with Tableau, what we're able to do is we're able to get into a conference room, we're able to go to their desk, we're able to send them a, a file or build a dashboard, and they can review all these potential territories at their leisure or with us interactively. And happier, happier people, right? We, no one enjoyed using the stuff that we had before. Uh, everybody likes using Tableau. Uh, we already have it. And it's another tool that people don't have to relearn. We don't have to relearn another tool every single year. Now Justin's going to go over some best practices for us. All right, All right thanks everyone for coming again today. Um, so yeah, I want to go over a little bit of best practices. Uh, some of the things with it as we go through, um, the first thing that we want to kind of talk through, which I'll spend more of my time on in the next few slides, but is the timeline. Uh, people talk about it. It's a hypothetical nice to have, but it, in my opinion, is a must have to do it or effectively and efficiently with a, as you have and scale your organization. People don't know what the deadlines are, what are the major milestones. Essentially, you're just kind of waiting until the last possible minute. It's like college, right? You're procrastinating all the way until the papers due the night before to write something. If you can make iterative steps to get there, it helps the process out a lot more. Um, the next thing is engaged stakeholders. As Hunter was talking about, um, when I first came in and about five years ago, uh, the territory planning process was very much, here's sales rep and sales managers, here's all your territories for you know 75 inside sales folks. Okay, well, I wanna make a couple tweaks. It's like, well, that's a lot of time, we can't do that, we've already got other deadlines. Um, when Hunter came on and when I came on, we were able to actually take that and make it a little more iterative, a little more pro or, uh, collaboration based. So going back to the timeline, we were able to say, here's our checkpoints for how we're going to kind of evaluate these territories as we go, but also they were part of the process. So being able to have engaged stakeholders that actually feel bought in, we have found has been very beneficial. Um, and anytime you just tell somebody what to do, it's a little bit more challenging than helping them or t having them be a part of the process. Um, next, for successful, is really clear um, definitions around segmentations. As you grow your businesses, being able to define out what is a strategic account, what is the difference between an enterprise and a commercial, um, even if it's, there's some gray room, uh, everyone likes to argue about the, the laws or the uh, rules, but if you at least have a baseline, it enables you to expand and accelerate faster. Um, for example, in our company, we've grown our healthcare business in the uh, United States very drastically since 2014. Um, and also our SLED and uh, slight state and local and education, so local governments and then education base. And a lot of that really is due to the rules that we've put in place. Uh, reps feel confident that as we, when new leads come in, new people earn in, interest in the product, we're able to get it into the right person's hands to work. There's not, it goes to the inside commercial person who does zip code 98021 where I'm from, and they work it and close it. It's no, it's part of the SLED organization, it goes to this rep. So it's always nice to have things, I think, but I, in my opinion, as you scale outwards, it's a must to have. You gotta have clear segmentation rules. What is your delineation between big customers and small customers? Um, it's a rough go once you start going, but once you have it in place and it's part of just the annual process, again, going back to the timeline, um, it's one of the, the bubbles, so to speak, that we'll talk through um, for when, where it fits into the general process. Um, the next is a headcount and growth plan. Uh, it's, this is probably the most complex part uh, as it relates to attrition and um, you know, onboarding new folks and people changing roles. This is a very, very, very time consuming process. Um, the more tools you can put in place to make this easier is the better. Um, you can be death by spreadsheets for sure. Um, but having the plan to, as we start going through, you'll, hopefully you'll see why it's important as we have these plans of how do you want to create territories it will enable you to accelerate and be more transparent um, throughout your headcount plan process, not only with the direct reps, but the managers and the directors and the VPs. And if they understand that, it actually helps um, drive the timelines and actually have bought in uh, to your compensation plans as you start distributing them out. Um, and then Hunter will go over a little bit more around clear definitions uh, for metrics. Uh, I think one thing, and Tableau struggles with it too, um, is really defining what is a, a customer, right? Is it a top parent account in Salesforce? Is it a sales account? Like, it sounds very easy, but actually having that written as a, like, you know, a live documented source of some, where, whether it's in your Tableau data sources or whether, whether it's in a wiki page or where it, wherever it's at that you guys have a centralized repository for information at your organizations, it's cr uh, crucial to do that. 
what is the difference between add-on business versus new business versus renewal business um, versus like service attachments rates to deals, certain just metrics that drive and that you want to have, as a lot of people say KPIs, right, that you're trying to measure to. Um, but also too, so the more granular stuff, uh, net new leads and stuff like that. So. So let's talk a little bit more now about the sales planning process. Um, I see, or at Tableau, we see it in really fee three phases. Um, the first phase is approximately, uh, our planning process overall is about five months. Um, we're in the middle of it right now. Uh, it's by far the busiest time. Um, and, oh, sorry, it's distracting. Uh, the first three, two months is where I say is really as you go to market. So what does that mean, right? Like, the top three things that I think, or that I think of is really your revenue by uh, geography. So think about wherever your organization is, there's a sales leader who's responsible for it all. Um, for us, it's Dan Miller. He is the Tableau software, like head of sales. That's, he has a number that Adam and him talk about and they you know, measure to, and there's all those sub-measurements. But really, Dan has a number that he's trying to get to. Um, as you get into that next year's growth plans and stuff, there's maybe he wants to break it down by different businesses, but overall it's gonna be two numbers add up to one. It's always gonna be one number that you get to. So um, I recommend going at least two levels deep. So Dan and then his direct reports. Uh, if you're good enough and sophisticated, go three levels deep, right? Like Dan, his direct reports, um, whether it's Americas, the US, EMEA, APAC, and then within those regions you break down into even further sub bullets. Um, but use that for your business, right? Like maybe if you're just domestically, how do you just break it down into the United States and then East, West, Central? Like how do you think about your businesses and your leadership uh, chain? This is where the roster actually comes really important. Um, two is segmentation. So like I was talking about earlier, we'll go a little bit deeper. Um, but this is really just the phase of like, all right, we've got our top sound target. Now how are we gonna get there? Like what are the uh, strategies that we're gonna put in place as we start looking at growing into different markets um, or expanding our current one or um, looking to change the way that our sellers sell orders, like re whether it's we have a minimum order size or what you do. Um, and then the third one really is your resource model, right? Now that you have a, you have a top level number, uh, you have your different theaters that generally speaking know how each other is gonna be responsible for the business. Um, you have some segmentation rules, you now get into the resource model. Um, this is an iterative process too, right? Like sometimes you go back and forth, but as you adopt this and apply it, it actually becomes really successful because it's a linear path that people can see um, a completion and milestones too. Um, but the resource model is really like, okay, we have these number of direct sellers, we're gonna do a ratio for overlays or pre-sales consultants, um, for uh, deal desk support, for marketing team. This is where really you're talking about how are we going to, uh, like customer acquisition costs. Like it's a very big metric that people wanna know. This is really the heart of at least a blueprint to before you start getting further into territory creations and comp plan designs. This is at least a blueprint that you guys can use as you go throughout your planning process. Um, second phase of the process we're talking through here is the territory and quota creation. So um, don't underestimate the amount of time that this takes. I think a lot of people try to squeeze this into a two, three week window and it's not. It actually requires more of a month, two months depending on your scale. Um, but going through this, we'll go really heavy today around um, our commercial territory for how we do territory construction. Um, quota distribution, we'll go, I'll have a slide on that, but really that's now looking at what are our roles, what are the quotas within those roles, and as you start looking from a bottom, like uh, go to market, right, it's more of a tops down, like what is our tops down methodology, and now we start applying right here is really our bottoms up. How many people are on the team, what is the quotas, what are the difference of ramp schedules, how does that affect, um, when are we gonna to plan to do future hires that affect how our quota numbers roll up? So just things to think about as you mature out, those are really important questions as you get bigger and if you're a public company for how you set your quotas. But if you're a smaller company, it, it just helps you think about how you can scale out long term too. Um, sellers to territories, that is as simple as it sounds. You're actually, now you've constructed these territories, you know the quota roles, it's putting people into those seats. Um, I think of it more of like a roster seat. Um, I'm a sports person, so you have different positions in teams, right? You have, you have to have people in these positions. Some teams have started undefining positions, but generally speaking, you have people that need to fit those roles in the team, and that's where now, okay, we're gonna fit um, Jim into these three territories, we're gonna fit Sue into these five, um, and then, but we know that we're gonna hire two, two new people on that, and so therefore, you're just communicating with them, like, hey, you're taking these two territories, you're gonna babysit, so to speak, these three, um, and then now we get into the final phase, which is the shortest of the durations, but that's, this is really your T's and C's, right? Like what are the rules, what are the comp plans, 
and the official um, kind of legal HR uh, distribution of these so that people know how am I going to make money, what is my, like, where am I um, expected to grow, or what am I expected to do. Um, so yeah, getting quotas to sellers, and then the final thing really is issue, um, issue plan documents. So let's jump into the revenue by target real quick. So yeah, as I was breaking, or as I was saying earlier, this is really hard to read, I know in the back, I'm really sorry. Um, but up top is uh, Tableau, right? And then you break into your different regions. So EMEA, USCA, APAC, um, United Kingdom, or yeah, United Kingdom, DOC, East, West, Japan, India. Um, we think of our top of our territory pyramid or uh, hierarchy as really our geographies. Your geographies really shouldn't change much. There should just be tweaks as you go and you grow, but that's really the core of how your sales leaders should work together. Um, the nice part that I think, uh, just to d like double down into this, is that this actually gives transparency not for Dan and his direct, or Dan and just who his direct reports are, but also their direct reports as well too. It's kind of showing transparency of who is being responsible and everyone having bought into the organization. It's a tricky uh, thing to open up this much transparency, but it, it accelerates the ability to share and collaborate and also like, you can get into market sizing too, right? Like, oh, what is the expect, or in um, Asia Pacific, we're expected to see a 20% increase. Well, in the domestic in the US and BI, we're only supposed to see 2%. Like, hey, like, APAC leader, why are you only taking a 10% growth versus the America's taking a 20% growth, right? right? It just helps those type of conversations and collaborations. Um, at Tableau, we are very transparent. Anybody can open up our quota dashboard and see exactly where any seller, whether it's a direct person, a manager, a VP, or the head of sales where we are at within 25 minutes of um, orders processing. It's, it's a little scary, I think, for some people, but at the same time, it like, creates a culture of collaboration. Um, and it, right, it does have some threats to it, but if you can just eliminate those threats around um, poaching and stuff like that, it just it opens up a totally different broad set of like, achieving as you go throughout a 90-day um, window for sellers. Um, segmentation, I think of these, I break these down into really three bins, geographies, uh, vertical markets, and then lines of business. Um, so your geographies are really what I was kind of showing earlier. What are the subregions? What are the districts? Well, how do you make the rules of what, it, what fits into what within the different segmentations? Um, second is really your vertical market. So as you start going outside of your core business and the core rules that you have, what are the different markets that you guys are trying to establish, whether it's financial services, whether it's um, high tech, whether it's uh, healthcare. And when I say these things, put like definitions in it. Like it's a sick code list of these five, like these 66 are sick codes if any of you use Duns and Bradstreet. Um, or these like written out vertical markets or um, part of these hierarchies. So these vertical markets are crucial as you kind of subset out the pies um, so that people know the rules and engagements that go around them. Um, and the third is really your line of business, and that's kind of where I'd say your core business is. That's the difference between your, your small customers or your big customers. Um, customers that you want to focus on e-commerce or customers that do require more of a longer sales cycle. Um, a lot of that will depend a lot on your, uh, the duration of the sales cycle and the, uh, the deployment of considerations as it relates to your products, right? We can't forget about how important it is to think about your development team and how your products and how your customers adopt it. That's something that at Tableau we take and try to apply into our sales methodology because we don't want to do things that are unnatural and the dev team's not ready for it. We want to make that iterative process. Going back to the revenue by target, Dan Miller actually goes to our um, EVP of um, product development and works with them. Hey, here's what I'm thinking. And it's just a very open conversation across so that they know like, oh, we got to add certain languages in certain countries if we're going to put some, like hedge our bets, right? just being in sync as you go through this planning process. Um, the resource model, uh, I put this pyramid, it, I think everyone's different, but I think just as you scale outwards, you'll start seeing that the bottom really is the small medium business, your commercial business, your territory business. Um, there is, at least domestically in the United States, there is a ton of small business. There's companies that are underneath $500 million of annual revenue all over the place. Um, and it takes a lot of people and time to get to that big base um, and then you get, as you go up the pyramid, you get all the way up to strategic accounts, and those are fewer sellers, right, but they're big businesses, so like, it could be that 80% of your revenue is in the top pyramid, whereas 20% is on the bottom, and it's just figuring out um, how to resource that model. Um, we'll go even further in today, but just to reiterate the dashboard, we'll get you to a final polished dashboard in the process to also get there, but this is really the territory construction phase of actually getting 
what accounts go to which territory and so forth. Um, quota distribution. Uh, this is going to be different for every organization, of course, and I keep saying it, but uh, being able to actually have a um, career ladder of what does it mean and what's the promotion path internally for your direct sellers as they move through um, the pyramid scheme, or not the pyramid scheme, but the more of the pyramid of like being a seller, right? How do I enter in and what's my promotion path? What is, what is it, the, where's the carrot that I'm looking to try to get to? Um, whether it's I'm really happy in my role and I want to grow into it in the next five years or like I'm really aggressive and I want to get there in five years. Being able to have this mapped out and have the quota to see like, oh, well, if I want to be a strategic account manager, well, that means my quota in the U.S. is going to be about $3 million. Well, right now, as a commercial territory rep, I'm only doing $750,000 and I'm and I only and I have 200 accounts first. I'm only going to have five accounts when I get to that role. How am I going to get there? What are the things I need to do? So just being able to map that out. Um, very straightforward here, but getting territories to sellers. If you guys have big organizations, don't let this be a two-day exercise or a three-day exercise. Um, make it an iterative process with your managers as you're creating those territories and looking at those quotas. Get them to have an understanding of uh, how will that person be successful if you have a fully staffed roster. If you fully hired on everybody, how does everyone have a fair and equitable shot at getting there? That's very important as you're getting to selling or uh, assigning sellers to territories. Because if you just go about it and you're just trying to get things done, six months down the road, you're going to look and go, well, why is Jim at 700% of his quota and Sue's only at 2%? Just being able to be proactive with that and having uh, some conversations. So pass it over to Hunter to go over some of the key metrics and definitions. All right, thank you, Justin. So yeah, so what, as we go through this, and we're going to build these territories. We take territory uh, equality very seriously at Tableau, um, not only for the reasons why Justin said about the quota attainment, but also just from an HR standpoint, right? Like if people feel like they've, they've not been given a, an equal ter territory where they have an equal chance of success, oftentimes they're going to leave, right? Like if they feel like they're disadvantaged, no one's going to stick around for 10 months to see how it plays out, right? So by giving everyone a fair and balanced territory at the beginning, we help improve our Salesforce retention, and we also help their managers, right? Because their managers have a much better idea of, oh, okay, is this person underachieving because is it their territory is just bad, or are they underachieving because they're just not putting in the effort of their job, right? And knowing that we have a solid foundation and we're able to balance those territories effectively really helps provide the managers a much more secure feeling about it. So. And as you're identifying key metrics for optimization, I'm going to just echo what Justin says, right? Like your line of business is going to be different, right? Like we can't apply a software sales model to, to every other business, you know, it just doesn't work that way. Um, but one of the things you can do is what are, your, what are your, the things that really drive your business, right? So for us, one of the th some of the things we look at, number of customers, transactions, spend, new customers, spend from new customers, product adoption, right? That would be more of a Microsoft type model. If you have a really broad suite of product offerings or multiple lines of business, you may want to look at what's my penetration within each of these different lines of business, right? Maybe they've got a lot of office and they've got a lot of, you know, access licenses, but we haven't sold them any cloud services, right? So looking at, at exactly kind of what, what they're doing in each line of business could also be a really valuable data point. Uh, renewal spend, if you're in a type of business where you're offering a subscription service. Uh, leads if you're in more of a, a net new or business development type of role. So one of the things that we do as we go through and we try to identify our key metrics is we, we don't just kind of pick them out of a hat, right? Like that's not, not an effective way to run your business. What we do is we go and we actually thoroughly test uh, our valuation models against our historical performance. So that's, I, I know, a, a really big leap for some organizations. So. At the least, what you should be doing is getting your metrics. So we build training sets, right? So our training set in here, we, you know, we take our cutoff is 10-1-2017. We'll create various look back summary metrics. So how many leads were there in the preceding two years? What were the sales like from this postal code in the preceding two years? Or this could be our account as well. Uh, how many customers, customers wouldn't work so much for the account? Could be how many people have bought, right? Um, but how many customers were there as of that date? And then we go and we calculate the forward sales. So, okay, and then for the next 12 months, what did we see out of this postal code? And by going in there and even just looking at linear correlations is gonna be an incredible start, right? If you wanna get super advanced, you can build some machine learning models. You can, you, know, you can get as heavy into it as you really wanna get, but you need to get into it at some level. Um, 
because you know, especially in a lot of industries, right? Like, how do you determine when a customer is saturated? How do you determine when there's going to be a lot of really great new activity because you've been doing business development there for the last year and it's finally starting to pan out uh, and it just is, you know, primed to explode? How do we really capture that effectively? All right, so we're going to go ahead and, and, and walk you through an example use case, which is going to lead into our demo. <clears throat> just setting the context here first, and w then we'll we'll get to the uh, more technical stuff. All right, so we're going to plan. We're going to go through a, a relatively simple planning scenario here. We need to plan territories for three account managers in 2019. Uh, Justin and I are running sales ops at an office supply company. We're using the Global Superstore uh, data set, which you guys are probably familiar with. Uh, we've determined that our three key metrics. You know, we've been in we've been in the basement, like running the numbers. Uh, for the last week, we figured out that lifetime transactions indicate 30% of future sales. Number of customers in that postal code indicates 30% of future sales. And the spend in that postal code in the last two years indicates 40% of future sales. So we're going to create a composite metric with these three. So one of the things you're going to notice in here is we, at Tableau, we don't just do one territory per sales rep. Uh, at the, uh, the commercial role, typically. What we do is we'll, we, we'll do four or five territories. And that gives us uh, a lot of opportunity to be agile mid-year without having to have a totally disruptive territory recarving session. Right? So we, if I give each one of you four territories, and all of a sudden we determine, OK, midway through the year, we need to add you know, half as many people again because business is really great, we can accommodate that very easily by just peeling off one territory from each direct seller and giving them to the new people. Right? So you can choose a ratio that works effectively for you. We, we like to use about four to five, because uh, it scales pretty well with our, our quota tiers. Right. So in this example, we've got our sales information at the transaction level. And we're going to need to aggregate upwards to the customer postal code. And we're going to do that using Tableau Prep. So as we go through and we are using prep to ready our metrics for territory creation, we're going to normalize the measures or scale them. The reason why we do this is because it lets us compare two different types of numeric data against each other. So if I asked you, said, hey, Rob, can, I, can you add up the, the total of the number of employees and the dollars of spend? You're like, uh, <laughs> hmm, I don't, I don't know. How are, how are we going to accomplish that? Well, so we're going to go ahead and scale these to a, a standard fixed scale. That's going to help us preserve the linear relationship and let us compare the measures against each other more easily. Um, once, so once we've aggregated it appropriately, right, we're so at the postal code level or the state level or the account level, we're going to divide by the maximum observed value we see in our entire data set. Then we're going to multiply it by what we want our maximum to be. So you could say it's on a, a scale of 0 to 1,000 or 0 to 100 or 0 to 10,000. You know, it depends on how many zeros you like to see. Uh, so in our previous example, if our, we know our global maximum is 10,000 employees and a million dollars in sales, we take our $100,000 in sales, divide it by a million, multiply it by 1,000, just because that's what we want our, our largest number to be, and we have a sales index in that postal code of 100. If we do the same thing for employees, we have 2,000 employees, a 10,000 maximum, multiply it by 1,000, we get t an employee index of 200. Assuming we were going to weight them all equally, we said that they all were worth the same in our final metric, we would end up with 100 plus 200 equals 300. Right? But in able to do this accurately and effectively, you really need to understand kind of the proportional contribution of each metric to the bottom line. So now that we've given you some background, Ooh, we're not ready for the takeaways yet. <laughs> we're going to get into the demo. You guys will have these slides, and yeah. we'll give all yes. the content to. Um, yeah. So at the end, we're going to put up uh, we're going to put up a link on the screen. That link is going to have all of the files, all of the workflows, and all the dashboards that we show you today. And that you're going to be able to download it as soon as you basically have the URL for it. Uh, you can take that home with you now. You don't have to wait for emails to come out, or you know, forget about it. And then a week later, you get an email and you don't remember what you wanted to look at in the first place. Like you're going to be able to download it all right now. All right. So first, we're going to start in prep. Um, and what we do, one other kind of interesting thing we do at Tableau is we assign, even if we have no accounts there, we are, are going to assign every postal code an owner, even if we've never received a lead from it, even if we've never had an account there. Because in the event that we do get a lead, we do get an account, anything happens there, we have predefined ownership of that postal code. It's another thing we do just to eliminate the, any sort of disagreements or, or churn among that type of stuff on our, our sales team. 
right? It doesn't really cost us anything to map all the postal codes, even if nothing's going on there. All right, so we're gonna start. We've got a bunch of transactional data from our trusty global superstore data set. It's got some order dates, it's got some customer names, it's got the segment that they're in. So for us, we're serving just the home office and the corporate. We're not doing the consumer side. And we've got some information about the state and the country and the region. And we've got postal codes in here as well, most importantly. So within our data set though, because we're, we're not that big of a company and there's nothing going on in a lot of postal codes, one thing we don't have is every single postal code in the United States. So we've got a reference here that has every single postal code in the United States with its latitude and longitude. That's also gonna be included in the file that you're gonna be able to download. So we're gonna go into our orders, we're gonna filter it based on country and segment. So we're gonna filter it down to that, uh, that corporate and home office segment. We're gonna go ahead and filter it to the US as well because we're just running a US-based scenario. Uh, we've got all of our postal codes here. It's pretty simple, we have country, which is just gonna be US for this example, postal code, the state, and their latitude and longitude. We're gonna do a right join with the postal code, so we're gonna keep every postal code and we're gonna keep all of the orders that match that postal code. So then we're gonna do a little bit of uh, calculation in here and in an interest of time, I'm not gonna go through every calculation, uh, but we're gonna, just look back and check if the date is within the last 24 months of whatever period we're wanting to snapshot, so in our case, October 1st. And if so, we're gonna calculate the sales, and if not, we're gonna put it to zero, so that when it adds up, we just get a zero. Uh, we're gonna do a little bit of postal code fixing, uh, because we had a little bit of some extra long postal codes in our orders. We had some zip plus four, we had a few that were missing a leading digit, so we're gonna do a little touch up there. And then we're gonna use this uh, aggregate function in Tableau Prep to group by postal code and state and sum up these metrics that we created. Uh, then, uh, because we're doing prep, right, we, we need a way to reference that maximum value because we wanna do our indexing. So we're gonna use another aggregate function. First we're gonna create what we we'll call a, a dummy join field where we just create a join placeholder value that's equal to one. We're gonna aggregate and we're gonna find our maximum and group by that placeholder, and then we're gonna join it back. So now every row is gonna have the, the value for that individual postal code as well as what the global maximum value was. And then we can just very quickly do a division operation on there. We're gonna calculate the index, which is that postal code's value, divided by the global maximum. We're gonna drop some fields we don't need. And then we're gonna output it. So at this point, we've got a list of 42,000 postal codes, and every one of them has an index value. Now, what you'll notice is that a lot, of our, a lot of our postal codes, there's really nothing going on. In this data set, I think we have customer activity in like 900 postal codes. We've got 42,000 postal codes. But because we're anticipating really great growth in our office supply company for the next couple of years, we still wanna make sure we, we assign all of them. But if you're the person who's doing the territory creation, you don't really wanna spend all your time assigning 41,000 empty postal codes in Tableau. That doesn't sound like really something that's gonna make our employees very happy, right? And we said that we wanna have happier employees. So one of the things that we did in order to accommodate this that was helped massively by a feature that our development team rolled out a couple years ago uh, called Custom Geographic Territories is we use this R script, which is also gonna be in that packet you can download. Uh, and it's very simple, I've parameterized it all. So um, as long as you basically use that prep workflow template, you can just install R, and run this script. We've got some notes in there if you wanna really dive into it. But this is free, this is a free product that's available to download. So it's very simple, we have this function called unit cluster. We tell it what file we want to cluster and where we want, where we want it to go. It's gonna run pretty quickly. And what we're doing here, I'll just explain quickly while it runs, is we're creating these kind of intermediate units because we found for a lot of our divisions, state is too big, right? Like we wanna have like five people in California, but how do you subdivide California? I wanna have five people in California, but I don't necessarily wanna hand allocate every single postal code within California. So what we're doing here is, is this is actually showing the number of clusters of postal codes it's creating for each state. So some states where we have no activity, like our office uh, supply chain, we, uh, we have no customers in Alaska currently. So we just divide Alaska into two pieces instead of having to do every single postal code within Alaska. So now that this is written out, we can go ahead and open it in Tableau Desktop. And you see what, what the data that we've created 
What's nice too with prep, as you guys saw, which we didn't know before yesterday's or uh, <laughs> of, Tuesday's keynote, is that you R and Python will be in line with prep. So this step of going outside and going back in will be just all within Tableau prep. Yeah, I was really hoping that I would be able to like do a live demo of the brand new feature, uh, but we ran out of runway on it. Uh, because, well, first they announced it like 30 minutes before our, our, our session on Tuesday, so we definitely didn't have enough runway then. Uh, we still didn't have quite enough runway today. But um, next year when we do this presentation, that R, this R code is going to be in line in prep, and you're not going to have to go out of your flow and do it. It's just going to go ahead and cluster it just in line, and it'll be super smooth, super seamless. I'm really hyped. Uh, it's going to be a, a real big game changer for us as far as enabling to distribute this out to global teams very effectively. Uh, so you see we've our final product out of the clusters. We've got our latitude, our longitude, our state, our postal, and our index value. And now we've got a new attribute called cluster. See, we've got two different ones for Nebraska here. So I'm going to show you how, if you've never done this before, how you might want to utilize this cluster feature. So in cluster, if we right click on cluster, we choose geographic role and create from. I don't know how many of you have ever noticed this ability in Tableau Desktop before, but now we've said that, hey, cluster is a geographic you know, field, and it's derived from postal code. So if I go to cluster and I say, give me a chloropleth map, it's going to spin for a minute, because in the background, we're doing some pretty heavy geoprocessing here, where we're dissolving 42,000 postal codes into, not exactly sure how many we've got in here, probably 200 or 300 distinct shapes. So there's a whole bunch of geographic aggregation that's going on in the back end. We went through a lot of back and forth with Dev on this as we built this tool out, um, because it's, it's a pretty complicated thing that we've made pretty simple behind the scenes. Great. So now we've got our, ter our clusters here, and you can see that now we've got some units that are much bigger than a postal code, but smaller than a state. And in states where we don't have a lot of business activity going on, we haven't made very many clusters. In states like California, where we have a lot, we've made more. The, idea, the way that we've written the script is we should have enough logic built into here that we're trying not to make any more clusters than we really need to. We, we do some guesstimates based on the kind of the density of index within a state, uh, average territory size that we desire, and, and a few other things. So now that we've got this, we can drag index on here as a label. And we can see exactly how much index value each one of these has. So we said we wanted to make nine territories. So I can go in here. I don't even need to open up my Windows calculator. So I got 32,820 points of index. And I can go in here and I can divide that by nine. And I can see that our target index per territory is 3,647 points. So we know that we're not going to be able to get every single one exactly at 3,647, right? We'd love to be that precise, but oftentimes it's not, uh, it's just not doable without creating some pretty wonky geographic territories. The rule that we use is typically plus or minus 5%. So in this case, we'll take a little guesstimate here and we'll say about yeah, 3,500 to 3,800 is our target range. And this is the case where we may have some, some instructions from uh, one of our sales executives that they'd prefer to, you know, we want to underweight the metro areas a little bit because we feel like there's better upside and we'd rather overweight some of the rural areas, right? You know, we can use this to pretty flexibly deploy whatever strategy we might like. And it depends. If you're a business that does really well in rural areas, you might want to do the inverse. All right. So now I'm going to go ahead and show you exactly how we use a grouping function to create these territories. So I'll start in Manhattan because it's a very dense area. And typically it works pretty nicely to iterate outwards. You can see here, it's probably a little bit tough to see. It works better when you're on the desktop, but we've got an index sum number here, about 3,300 so far. We're going to go and we're going to create, we, we have a lot of zero groups in here. We're creating kind of a, what I would call a northeast territory. And we're kind of, you know, radiating outward. So there we go. So we're at 3,544 for our first one. We're going to right click and we're going to group that. So now we've got territory number one, right? And so some people like to go and name these as they go along. We have a script that does a bulk rename because we create um, two to 300 of these a year. 
So we're, we're not interested in doing a lot of hand renaming. <laughs> we, we, do, we do some programmatic renaming. But if you're, uh, you know, you're serving this up in a dashboard in the interim or something, you may want to go do that. Right? So we'll go ahead and I'll create a few more and you guys can kind of watch as I go. And if anyone has any questions, Justin can field a couple questions uh, while I create the rest of our sales territories. You know, I'll just make a quick note. Like the index is a um, compository, right? It's not a guaranteed of what's exactly going to happen, but rather instead of you just saying, we're going to use the number of accounts and that's going to be our measure of how effective reps are going to be, it's like, no, we've taken into multiple uh, considerations, the number of leads, number of transactions, so your velocity of your business, how much is the business growing, um, as well as the spend, or if you have really good pipeline and you trust that the reps and how that you're measuring pipeline, right, whether it, um, you're doing weekly check-ins or um, how much you're scrubbing the pipeline to keep it clean, but if you trust the, I, I always say trust the uh, future looking data, right? If you trust it, you can apply it into these, this compository so that it's, it's not only future looking, it's also historical looking and it kind of blends the two of them together to give a little bit of a sample representation. Um, when we show new sales leaders that come onto Tableau this, it kind of blew their mind at first. They're like, well, I came from Oracle and we just used how much spend happened in the past year. And it's like, well, that's good, but what if an area is saturated, right? Like the velocity will start showing a little bit more. I mean, like Hunter was saying, as you guys have more, uh, if you have people who are in the data science world, how can we put a little bit more like machine learning behind this index score, right? Like what can we apply? We've started doing that with ours. Um, and you can start seeing how effective as you get into different types of um, predictive models. But this compository is a really good indicator. And especially as you aggregate upwards, we've seen it actually be extremely accurate um, as you go up to districts and subregions. Um, right, because Hunter's, yeah. right, right now we're showing individual territory creation. If you think about this, you can go to the next level up to go to the, what does the district look like? Okay, I have four district managers. What is the difference between their territories um, that I just created? Now I want to look at the subregion because we got two VPs in the east and the west. So we just want to look at the balance between the two of them. Um, and then the other thing too that we'll show as we get into show like a final polished up dashboard is that you can actually have all the metrics shown across. What is the lifetime spend? What is the number of leads? What are the transactions? So that it's, and what is the index, right? You can see all of them and you, it can get to analysis paralysis, but also it provides accurate information as you're getting into and creating these. I mean, right now we're talking in less than an hour and we're gonna be able to show you what you could do in theory with, what your, uh, with your sales leaders. You can sit in a meeting room and do this. Um, the more you practice, right, the quicker you're gonna get, the better you're gonna get. You all have different tricks and tricks, or you, everyone's gonna have different ways to be efficient. Um, but you can even, in your shape files and stuff, you could have boundaries pre-existing so that you could just focus on the east first or you could focus on the central. Um, so yeah, if anyone's got any questions or anything, we're, we'll feel free to um, raise your hands and ask away. We wanna make it. Yeah, I'll add, yeah, we, we do, uh, we use this a lot to balance um, our subregions as well, right? So we're looking at this metric and we're looking at our expected headcount in each subregion and we're, we're looking at our, our index ratio per rep across the subregions and across the districts and then using that to inform our final headcount plan as well. So now, we're almost done. Does anyone have any general questions or just comments or thoughts? We want to try to make it as a collaborative. We want to make sure that yep. everyone leaves us some, some information. Yes. Yep. Yeah, it's a, yeah. so his question was, um, did you look at break, not breaking up like metropolitan areas and certain or certain geographic um, uh, boundaries and so forth. Um, that R script actually, so we, uh, I'll talk a little bit, I guess. Uh, take That's the thunder. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the postal codes, right, like give you a list of all the postal codes. And then in our case, we just said we want like one of the rule or one of the fields in there is the boundary. And the boundary would be, in the, our case, was states. Don't break yeah. states up. But let's say you have a list of postal codes in metropolitan areas and you say, I don't want to break up metropolitan areas, right? That would be a boundary yeah. like limitation in that script. Yeah, so exactly. So if you look at this map here that we have on the screen, you'll notice that there's no cluster that goes across the state boundary. So there's a field, the state field we actually use to do a, a, an intermediate grouping before we do the clustering. And, and that ensures that no clusters cross state boundaries. Um, now to the metro area, that's an interesting one where we have a variety of uh, strategies that people want to execute on metro areas. Uh, we have some sales leaders that say, I want, you know, I want Jim to own all of Chicago and I want John to own all of Milwaukee. We have other sales leaders who are in areas where maybe one metro area drives a huge proportion of their business. 
for example, the Bay Area if you're in software sales. Uh, so we may execute on a strategy where we actually want you know, to create basically five slivers or pizza slices across the Bay Area. Uh, and so in our case, we'll generate very small size clusters. There's actually where, where you can, a variable in that script where you can change the size of the cluster. And so we'll generate very small clusters for the Bay Area and we'll create, so everybody owns kind of a little bit of slice of the Bay Area for feelings of equality. Otherwise on that team, it's like if you own the Bay Area, you'd be just smoking it and otherwise everybody's you know, out in like Napa Valley and the desert of Nevada trying to, <laughs> trying to sell software, right? So we, um, it really depends on, on the region and the specific sales strategy. And, and one of the things that we like about doing it this way is that we can customize it to, to the way that our regional directors want, want to do things. So if I need to split up Manhattan into tiny pieces, I can do that. I can actually go down and split up some individual postal codes. We can go levels deep in here as well. Um, or if I don't want to do that, so I can go pretty quickly, just for example, or I can go up and I can do it at state level if I only have two reps, maybe, and I just need to divide the US in two. Right, but I can go in here and I can group postal codes outside of the clusters as well if I, if I really need to. So what, one of the things we really like is it lets us be pretty flexible. Yeah, remember, like this data set is all the postal codes. It's not yeah. just these clusters that are coming through. Yeah. That it, so if you do need to go down to the next level of granularity, you still have that ability. This just helps that hand yeah. stitching, right? Instead of going from 42,000 to nine, you can go from 800 to nine, yeah. um, which is a lot easier problem to solve. And, and then once we've, we've already got it in Tableau, so we can just go ahead and immediately start making dashboards off this data. Um, oh yeah, question. Yes. Yeah, uh, so the question is we have, we have wholesalers that kind of specialize in, in certain lines of products within, within our business, and, and would we do three different versions of this? Um, yes, I, that's probably what I would do. We do, for like our healthcare segmentation, we do a separate one for healthcare, we do a separate one for financial services. Um, we do one for kind of what we call like vanilla, <laughs> you know, which is not necessarily like a specialized, more of just a mainstream line of business. So yeah, that, that, that's the way that we would, we would do it. Yeah, we have, um, so one of the things that we're responsible for producing is like a territory lookup map. And we have mm -hmm. dashboards that are essentially like type in a postal code and it will just show you who is the rep that would be responsible for the different business segmentations that you have. Um, there's a little, like, right, it's a, that's getting to the engine rules of segmentation and how do you route accounts. So if you have one account with multiple think people, it gets a little bit tricky and you gotta think about how you can do that in the system. Um, but at least with this and a Tableau dashboard, right, you have that ability to say like, look here, if you're, or if you have like a BDR team or a team that's routing leads or doing something like that, here, go look on this view. It should, if you know the rules and like the, the black and white uh, steps to go through, here's who should get that. And that's the goal of this is you actually get to ownerships of um, geo yeah. geographic land. Yeah. And so one of the things you may, if you're following along as I created those clusters, you notice that I made one that was pretty heavy and one that was pretty light. Um, so if you were going to do this as kind of a discipline, what you may want to consider doing is building a, a template like this one that Justin has built, where we can look pretty quickly and easily and we can say, you know, we've got a color coded. Anything that's more than plus or minus 5% is called out in red here. So we can go back and we can audit it later. Um, or may, you know, maybe that is the way that we want it for some particular strategic business reason, right? But we, we can call it out. We can adjust the threshold if we want to highlight stuff that's more than 10%. Uh, more than 20%, whatever your, your particular threshold might be. And we can see it at kind of a granular sort of state and cluster view. We can see it at a, an aggregate view. And then not just that, but we can look at the underlying data that's also feeding it, right? So like what was the sales in the last 24 months in that particular territory, the number of customers, lifetime transactions. So you see the no, one nice thing about this is by creating these composite metrics, we typically get stuff where it's relatively well balanced. Our Texas one, our sales are a little light, but we have a lot of customers and we have a lot of transactions. So we should probably um, get, so I want to make sure that everybody gets a link. So I'm going to switch back here for a second, just in the interest of time. Right, so hopefully we showed you how you can build territories pretty quick. We did nine territories in, in about 15 minutes. Uh, now, I would probably put a little more effort into a production territory, but just to give you an idea, uh, on previous software, we would probably still be, you know, like calibrating, we'd be spinning up. Uh, we're going to ensure that your group is aligned and engaged before we begin territory creation. And then, you know, we can use clustering to basically create these subunits that are, you know, help you take the, from the in-between stage where you don't need to assign every single postal code individually 
but you still need something that's smaller than a state. Uh, custom geography, thank you to our development group, uh, is what lets us uh, make that happen. Now, so here, this Git repo of mine is where you're gonna wanna download that. There's gonna be a, uh, the R script is available separate, so you can browse the source, and then all the other files are in a zip file. It's on there. Uh, and then here's a little link if you wanna download R Studio. It's free, it's open source. Uh, there's other IDs for R. I like R Studio. Take your pick. I right, saw so a question. Yep. Right here, go ahead. Um, I can, yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, this is really the, yeah, the territory creation side. I guess you're like, right, like John Lee is like, we gotta backfill his territory. Um, and we've built some stuff in Salesforce that's uh, two clicks essentially of put that person, or reassign that person, the territory assignment, and then they just go and transfer all the objects um, to it. So that Tableau doesn't, like right, Tableau doesn't write back to data, or applications and so forth, um, but you, if you're, if you're uh, crafty enough, you can create things that are like this, where it's like click this territory, opens up a URL in Salesforce, or your to use dynamic, or whatever the system is that you're using to assign territories. In the web interface, you can go and then, yeah, reassign it, and then if you do have a mass mover or something like that, some type of process that can move it, that's, yeah. um, I'd I say, will, yeah, for us, it's less than 30 seconds for a person to go and yeah. do that. Um, so one thing, yeah, ops. and from, from a loading perspective, we don't have it fully automated, but one thing that I like about this is that I can drag like a postal code in a state on here, and I can add that group. And if I just rename my group, now I've got a full mapping sheet. Dude, we missed our cleanup on a couple of postal codes apparently. But I've got, a full, I've got a full mapping sheet where I now have the postal code, the state, and like the territory name already mapped out, and if I have a, another spreadsheet that has my, where the region and subregion and district and all that stuff, I can join that in here and export this to Excel and load it into Salesforce or Dynamics right, right there through one of the loader tools. So it helps us stage it up, right? We have to do less like data gymnastics later because we've got basically already got a flat file of how we're gonna map out all of our postal codes. So I, I made a version that did that, and it took a while, because I mean, it's, this is one of the problems, right? Like these, it takes like, ours was taking 25 to 45 minutes to run, and a lot of times we, we spent just as much time reworking the output because we would have, I, I think we have some, some leadership that has very specific ideas of exactly what they want about their territories. So, and, and some of it's so precise we couldn't really rec represent it programmatically, and so we would spend almost as much time reworking the initial territory output that we got as it took to create it kind of from a blank slate. And kind of our, our consensus was that it felt a lot less annoying <laughs> also to like not be undoing and redoing a bunch of stuff that we waited half an hour to do. Um, but yes, you, you could do it if you, if you had an optimization package or, or something that you, you were versed in, um, you could definitely do it. I'm still playing around with ways to do it better. I have not found an unfrustrating way to, to do it so far. His question was, could you just oh, write yeah. nine territories in the R script and get an output? Like, yeah, in theory, but in kind of going back a little bit too, the, the idea here is that with Tableau, and I mean, if, if you have it within your organization and you can be collaborative, you're involving the other people that are affected by this too. Um, so being able to have them make, you know, make those tweaks, even if it's not like perfect data science in terms of like, here's what the machine gave us, go and like do your thing. It's like, how do we make that um, an iterative part? It, it's been a big thing. I mean. There's science, but there's also art, and how do you blend those two together? We found that if you make it a collaborative human element, um, taking some of the, the automation out, it actually results in more efficiency downstream. Yeah. But yeah, we, we did we use a, like a supply demand model, essentially, to generate random demand nodes, and then use the other post codes as, as supply nodes, um, which it, it generates territories that are roughly equally balanced, but they're suboptimal in a lot of, a lot of other ways. Yes. Got it. Yeah, so um, there, this is not a model that emphasizes continuity. Um, there are ways you can mitigate that. 
right, by having a large number, by creating, like we call like overloading territories, essentially creating four or five territories. Um, we can isolate which territories people owned a large percentage of those accounts in, in the prior years and prioritize them for those assignments. And so that would be like another dashboard we would make on top of this would be like an account continuity, um, like heat mapped by, by sales rep uh, to guide that process. Um, for these particular models, they're largely driven by net new business. Um, so continuity doesn't typically exist. Or, you know, and, and this is also, um, I would say, a group where a lot of people, like they're pre it's a pretty junior position often, not always. Like we do these for other, for lines of our business where we have much more senior reps and there we, we definitely do a lot of continu continuity exercises for some of our, our other divisions. It's less of a focus because often um, in the next year or two, there someone's going to be promoted. The uh, the other thing too is it's like part of the planning process. One thing that we do is that this is the last thing that we do. It's not the first thing. We don't cut territories, then go and do named accounts. We do named accounts. That's established. That's a baseline um, because actually some of the importance of named accounts is actually yeah. it plays into the postal code. Like how many named accounts are in the commercial like territory space because that has some influence over how effective um, and so actually having that baked into the planning and that's kind of why I wanted to give you guys a little bit of that template was that it gives you um, some iteration process like here's we got to have a cutoff of like knowing what accounts are going to speak be exceptions where they're not falling back into our geographic or we're trying to um, some people call it dialing for dollars but um, really where you have like geographic patches of land where people are responsible for for really your new business or the the small business that hasn't really spent a whole bunch. So yeah, I would say make it like bake that into the process where deadlines of like November 1st is our last day that we will accept it because now we have November 1st through the 15th where we're going to create these postal codes and people feel confident. Um, if you guys have big organizations uh, in your, like the piece of ownership is really important. Uh, if you're not doing, I would suggest snapshotting your firmographic data that you're using to route accounts. Um, because what that enables is as you start going throughout a planning process, if you do need to route accounts or do these things, um, and always looking back, you can have a snapshot version of what the firmographic was for why an account got to where it is so that those questions are eliminated as you go throughout the years. I don't know how many of you guys get emails of, why did this account move? What happened here? Like that, in my opinion, that's just wasted time for selling and that's things that we should eliminate um, from seller's um, mindset. Yeah, so yeah, to add on to that, we, we, our named account model, where you own basically like a discrete set of, uh, of accounts, we, we do put heavy emphasis on continuity there. And his question was, what do, how do yeah, we handle exceptions in this model? Like if I have a customer, or if I have a rep who's got a strong relationship and I don't want to move that account from him, but it's not going to be part of his geographic patch, how do I handle that? Um, so yeah, just being more proactive with what is that? So then that way it's out of the way and you can focus on the, the long tail of accounts that you're trying to focus on. Front row. Yeah. So we're using a, a K medians clustering algorithm. So what we we do is first at the state level we do kind of a broad calculation of how much index is in the state, and then one of the arguments you give that function is how many territories you want to create. And so we, we do first just kind of a global variable of like, okay, what's about our average, our desired index we want to have in a territory? And then in there, there's another factor that says essentially how many clusters do you want to create per territory? And then at the state level, based on those two numbers, we can calculate based on the total index in the state about how many clusters do we want to create in the state? Because if like we said, like Washington State looks like it's about one and a half territories and we've got like a, we want to create 10 territories or 10 clusters per territory, we'd, we'd aim to create approximately 15 of those clusters within the, within the state. And then we do a check on the clusters after we do our first round of clusters, we do a check to see if the cluster size is bigger than uh, our desired average territory size. And if so, we break up just the postal codes within that cluster one more time. So it is 45, so I want to oh, be cautious yeah. if you guys Skinner. do need to get to um, other ones, but also yeah. please. Yeah, we're happy to stay and, uh, and answer questions. Uh, please give feedback, though. It helps us as we try to evolve these talks and make yes. them better um, for not only you guys, but future people. So yeah, we'll be around to take questions. Yeah, yeah thank you all for months. coming. Uh, appreciate it.